The season and division championship lay at stake for the 1976 Cincinnati Bengals, and each man realized the consequences of this late November battle. Victory would mean a return engagement in the playoffs, where Super Bowl dreams could easily materialize on the might of possibly the finest total team in their nine-year history. Only one major obstacle remained. The arch-rival Pittsburgh Steelers, a team also desperately in need of a win to maintain their own playoff ambitions. Two powers, each eyeing the reality of being a champion, readied for the storms. Battle lines, drawn by the elements, bound both to basic ball control, and the end result was a real snowball fight. Runners stiff and chilled by temperatures hovering in the teens, the turning point came suddenly. Given superb field position, the Steelers seized the opportunity, made visual contact, then touched down in the Cincinnati end zone. Pittsburgh's 7-3 fourth quarter advantage seemed protected by the snow-slick turf of Riverfront Stadium. But against all odds, the Bengals trod the tightrope of a comeback. Though this Bengal flurry rivaled the Tempest itself, the end would find the snow and the Steelers as winners. Wedged between the forces that would shape the AFC championship, this loss to Pittsburgh, followed by one to Oakland, left Cincinnati without a playoff berth. Though cast a bitter ending, 1976 was a year of achievement for these men, a season where improvement in vital area gave these Bengals the look of a total team. If one were to pick a concept best describing the Bengal organization, Total Team would do nicely. For since Paul Brown founded this franchise in 1968, team strength has been the weapon by which Cincinnati has met every challenge. Retiring as head coach following the 1975 season, Brown left behind a Bengal squad sound and set in all phases. His successor, Bill Tiger Johnson, was prepared for the bicentennial season following eight years under Brown's tutelage and his prior knowledge of his team would prove invaluable during his first season as Bengal director. Johnson's years as an assistant were largely spent directing one of the best pass-blocking fronts in the game. Men like center Bob Johnson, number 54, the first Cincinnati draft pick ever, and Rufus Mays, Vern Holland, John Shinners, Dave Lapham, young Glenn Bujnock, and Ron Hunt, the Ken Anderson and John Reeves Protection Agency. Their pass blocking again enabled the Bengals to field one of the NFL's more feared aerial games. But their biggest contribution to the total team goal came when each supplied their muscle to secure a complimentary ground game. The run, almost non-existent a year previous, surfaced in 76 as crisp blocks freed multipurpose runners like Archie Griffin, number 45, and Booby Clark, Stan Fritz, Lenville Elliott, and Tony Davis. And the results benefited every aspect of their offense.
This overland power proved a complementary ploy for the pass, as defenses, now forced to respect a play fake, often realized too late the masked intention. Bengal fans witnessed an offense as subtle and diverse as any in football, an attack well stocked with pass run talent and wired to explode from anywhere at any time. With one major goal realized by achieving balance on offense, the Bengals' next phase of needed improvements centered in the area of the pass rush. Vital would be their ability to obtain a big, crafty rush man molded from the fires of previous NFL battles. San Diego had just such a veteran in Coy Bacon, who, after trading his Charger blue hat for one of Bengal orange, came face to face with all the doubts and speculations that haunt and follow a 34-year-old defensive end. But if there were any questions about the aged talents of number 79, they were quickly answered. Coy Bacon was reborn in 1976 on a team that warmed from his competitive fires, which joyfully blazed again. Number 79 arrived through rain, sleet, and snow to deliver the word personally, Coy Bacon was back. The pass rush expert claimed 26 sacks by himself, and the Bengals more than doubled their pass rush total from the year before as Bacon, Bob Brown, Ron Carpenter, and rookie Gary Burley had but one thing in mind. Cincinnati now had a force capable of snuffing out a fireworks display well before it could ignite. Quarterbacks, hounded into looking for a safe place to lie down, found none. You might escape one, maybe two, but it was doubtful you'd miss meeting at least one of the others somewhere along the way. Veterans Ken Johnson and Bill Kohler added quality depth, and under such strain, quarterbacks began to crack. With both pass rush and running game strengthened, the Bengals tomorrow burns bright, and especially so on the promise of its young. For most, early life in the NFL means taking a few notes on just how things are done. These are first and second year men, most hoping to catch an eye amid the proving grounds called special teams. Bengal bomb squads gave valuable game time to youngsters like punter Pat McAnally and hit men Melvin Morgan, Scott Perry, Glenn Cameron, Chris Devlin, Greg Fairchild, and John McDaniel, and all were eager to excel. Some use this demolition derby as a stepping stone to a starter's role. One was Bo Harris, number 53, a second season outside linebacker who graduated from busting kick return wedges to strong side sweeps. With Harris at one flank and rookie Reggie Williams, number 57 at the other for most of the season, the Bengals turn their opponent's strengths into weaknesses. While Bo Harris and Reggie Williams lent young, tough talent to the Bengals' total team approach, rookie place kicker Chris Barr gave Cincinnati three points from as far away as 51 yards.
Almost half of the entire Bengal squad competed in their first or second year in 1976, and 13 of those were rookies like number 30, Willie Shelby. Youngsters like Shelby recognize kicking team experience not only opens avenues to a regular's job, but gives one the opportunity to earn the respect of veteran teammates as well. But while special teams glow with promise for a player in his first season, by the third year, they can be the source of worry and doubt. For wide receiver John McDaniel, three years of solid special team duty had failed to produce a hoped-for starter's role. But though seemingly relegated to bomb squad obscurity, number 86 never forgot his goals or those of his team. And when finally given his chance, John McDaniel was ready. Suddenly, a player who had fielded but two passes during successive seasons was looting the world champion Oakland Raiders. John McDaniel set club records this night with nine catches for 201 yards. But while these feats signaled a belated arrival for one young Bengal, another was simply trying to outrun a reputation. Archie Griffin, the only man to ever win two Heisman trophies, hustled down the road from Columbus and stepped right into the Cincinnati huddle. Skeptics viewed Archie's smallish, five foot nine inch, 190 pound frame as reason enough to doubt his credibility amid the big man's game of the NFL. And Heisman hungry defenses did their share to confirm this judgment. However, early setbacks and discouragement, Archie handled like a pro. The confidence which had marked his brilliant Ohio State career never once wavered, for it was an attitude spawned by a deep belief in his own abilities and those with whom he played. Little hurts shaken off, Archie Griffin set out to prove himself worthy, and soon the critics were silenced. Just like the little engine who could, number 45 thought he could and thought he could. Until pretty soon, everyone, including himself, knew he could. Archie's 77-yard run during a win over the Chiefs showcased his big play capabilities and was the longest in the AFC in 1976. With all obstacles a Heisman reputation brings well behind him, Archie Griffin was accepted for what he had always wanted, and that was to be merely one of 43 Bengals, equally doing a part to give Cincinnati the look of a total team. that once relied almost totally on the ability of their offense to carry them is no longer. Bengal defense, coordination and execution geared for the big play and mean at midfield or goal line. Cincinnati met a Cleveland goal line challenge by refusing a touchdown despite eight pops inside the 10 during a 21 to six win. One week later, the Los Angeles Rams fared no better as the Bengals won again. But be it midfield or goal line, Bengal 30 was simple. Apply as much pressure as possible, then reap the rewards. There were some things, however, better off left to of the offense. 
But this was a crew that simply kept after it until they finally got it right. Coordination was such that as soon as one man was picked off, others quickly filled the void with power. Simply put, they were a tough and unselfish group of men whose togetherness enabled the Bengals to field a team defense bettered by only one in the AFC. With a CB handle like backbreaker, Jim LeClaire's execution as the Bengals' middle linebacker was also well defined. For this was one two-wheeler that, though he wore double nickels, never once stayed within the nation's speed limit while letting the hammer down on a trap, screen, or sweep. Leclerc traveled the thoroughfares of the secondary as well, dropping deep where flights were diverted. Mobile linebackers take away a quarterback's outlet pass, and the fact is, all Bengal linebackers like veteran Ron Pritchard went all out to do this. For since pro football is a passing game, there is nothing more important than coordinating your defense to stop. Cincinnati achieved this in 1976 on the combined skills of some of the best athletes in the game. Men like cornerback Lamar Parrish and strong safety Tommy Casanova, number 37. Three times Casanova scored, and his superb play was topped only by Ken Riley, who has for years been one of the most outstanding yet under-publicized cornerbacks in the game. Last season, however, number 13 grabbed headlines aplenty by gathering in nine interceptions, tops in the AFC. The aftermath was a season of which to be proud for Ken Riley. However, it was a performance which he credited to not only the improved Bengal pass rush, but the entire Cincinnati secondary as well. Lamar Parrish, Marvin Cobb, Bernard Jackson, Riley and Casanova. Together, the AFC's finest against the pass. Exceptional talent, shared accomplishment, and absolute confidence in themselves to carry out an assignment as called. All of this made the Cincinnati defense a total team. Once a hub revolving totally around quarterback Kenny Anderson, the Bengal offense displayed in 1976 a streamlined look of versatility. The running game had returned, and the result was an explosive attack also geared for balance. Given such an option, Anderson's passes became less predictable to opposing defenses, adding scope and consistency to one of the NFL's finest arms. Number 14's Thunderbolts made him the NFL's all-time leading passer in only his sixth season. It's safe to say that the best is still yet to come for this remarkable talent.
Anderson's achievements are, by his own admission, the end product of good pass protection and a talented and diverse core of receivers. One being Billy Brooks, Cincinnati's smooth striding first draft pick of a year ago. Chip Myers, number 25, gave Anderson a reliable target, but for consistency in six points, it was difficult to top tight end Bob Trumpy's act. One of only two original Bengals remaining, Trumpy always seemed to find an opening, and seven times these creases produced touchdowns for the man who has never lost the joys of the game. But while wonderful receivers are abundant in Cincinnati, the amazing one glides to a different beat. Isaac Curtis, all of what a receiver should be. A secondary's embarrassment and Kenny Anderson's delight. Concentration and absolute body control. Perfect coordination. This and more makes number 85 one of the most exciting players in the NFL. Throw in pure speed, and you have a talent his quarterback describes as one whom he must get the ball to swiftly as he does get out of range quickly. Though hard to imagine, each season, number 85 refines another aspect of his game. Last season, he polished his open field escape routine. Freewheeling through scattered resistance, Curtis excels when pressured by simply outdistancing his opposition. Sunday after Sunday, the exploits of Isaac Curtis are revered by Bengal faithful, who have, during four seasons, seen number 85 make impossible situations look routine. Such was the case against the Houston Oilers in week 10, when, with but 42 seconds remaining and trailing by three, the Bengals desperately needed a miracle for victory. Feats such as this typify the career of Isaac Curtis and the Cincinnati Bengals, both owning a constant of excitement, both with still so much ahead. Improved team phases realized one season, mold men that will better these feats during the next. So for the Cincinnati Bengals, 1976 produced 10 victories and was but another year in which a shining tradition beckoned a team founded upon individual strengths geared for the whole. A concept which has made these men consistent winners and a total team. <laughs>